a gorgeous, young Amish mom, just 23 years old and pregnant, is murdered in her own home in Amish country. What? In her own home. Now, according to many people that are familiar with the Amish lifestyle, they are deeply religious. They issue modern entrapments. They don't drive cars, much less flashy cars. Uh, many of them don't even use zippers to zip their clothing. They use buttons. They dress very plainly and try their best to emulate their Lord Christ by being humble and loving the Lord. So how in a community where there are not even zippers, much less guns, where uh, everyone has a vow of pacifism, does this young pregnant mom end up dead. Right now, only one clue to who did this deed. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. First of all, take a listen to Lieutenant Martin Windorf. PSP Corey got a call through 911 uh, of a deceased female that was uh, found at the scene here. Uh, we have we're responded at this point. Uh, we have confirmed the identity of the female, uh, that she is deceased, and it looks like suspicious circumstances. Right now, the police in Amish country are holding everything very tightly and close to the vest. We have managed to get the name of the victim, 23-year-old Rebecca Byler, 23 years old, and her unborn baby, both dead. We understand in the family home. We also understand two little children were in the home at the time of the murders. The murders, all of this is unfolding now. We are trying to confirm everything that we are learning. But right now, the hunt is on and the investigation is on for Rebecca's killer. Tip line, 814-663-2043, repeat. 814-663-2043. Again, this has occurred in Amish country, Pennsylvania. With me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now, but to Trooper Cindy Schick, PIO, Pennsylvania State Police, listen. The death is currently being investigated as a criminal homicide. Uh, we are aggressively investigating all available leads. We want to solve this just like the community wants us to solve it. So any information that's out there, we want people to come forward and, and help us um, resolve this issue. Joining me in All Star Panel to make sense of what we know right now, but I do know this. Typically, when LA law enforcement is begging the public for help, that means they really do need help in solving the murder of Rebecca Byler, just 23 years old, and her unborn child. Again, All Star Panel joining me. First, I'm going to go to Jennifer Barrasso, investigative reporter, KDKA TV. Jennifer, first of all, Tell me where this happened. Uh, if you guys uh, in New York could put up our Google Maps. It's, it's when I look down, I've looked at an aerial. I lived in Pennsylvania for a, a good bit of time and traveled to Amish country. It is, look at that. Look at that. All green. When you go to Amish country, uh, the, the plats on which the homes are situated can be three, four, seven acres. They're big. There's very low population. To Jennifer Barrasso, investigative reporter, KDKA-TV. Jennifer, again, thank you for being with us. Tell me about the area, and I've got a reason for asking this. Go ahead, Jennifer. 
So, Nancy, as you mentioned at the top of this report, that this Crawford County is a very, very rural county. It is about 25 miles southeast of Erie, Pennsylvania. There is a fair amount of Amish in the area. Uh, where this murder happened, the house was on a dirt road. So it would not be unusual if you drove through that area that you may not see your next door neighbor. Um, it's spread apart and that is a challenge for law enforcement right now. You know, sources telling me that this happened on a dirt road so you're not gonna have a lot of people driving there. Thus, not a lot of people, not a lot of witnesses, basically. Jennifer Brasso, that's exactly where I'm headed. You read my mind. Now, you know, in a lot of big cities, uh, they think the world ends at their city limits. But FYI, for your information, everybody knows I grew up on a red dirt road in rural Georgia. The vast majority of the U.S., is rural, right? So we need to address the realities of investigating a murderer in a rural area. And yes, this has been deemed suspicious circumstances. It is considered a homicide. This young 23-year-old mom has been shot dead. A pregnant mom, which I'll go into later with Dr. Jory Crawson, the single most dangerous time for a woman is during pregnancy murder, homicide being the number one cause of death amongst pregnant women. But hold on, Dr. Jory, before I get into the whole psychology of pregnant women ending up dead, I want to get these facts down. Back to Jennifer Barrasso joining us, KDKATV. As a matter of fact, isn't it true that the population of Sparta Township, Pennsylvania, Amish country, as we all call it, is a little over 18,000 people for the whole area. My research said 18,000, but I just heard 2,000, which is even more on the point I was making of a low population. Jennifer, what's the answer? You're correct. It, it is about 2,000 um, in terms of population. And once again, um, one of the biggest challenges, um, the lack of people, um, not only in the lack of technology, um, you know, my source is telling me the remote location, obviously a big challenge, um, but once again, lack of people in the area, lack of tech technology, and that is, is something law enforcement, they have to deal with. Joining us right now, in addition to Jennifer Barrasso, KDKA, and Jory Crosen, who I've already introduced to you, Dr. Jory, psychologist, former law enforcement, now faculty at St. Leo University. And by the way, you can find him at drjory, J-O-R-E-Y dot com. I want to go now to Jarrett Ferentino, homicide prosecutor in this jurisdiction of Pennsylvania at jarrettferentino.com. He's also the host of True Crime Boss podcast, wildly popular, I might add. Jarrett Fiorentino, down to the brass tacks, okay? When I'm in court prosecuting a um, homicide case, very often, uh, uh, except for their probative value, what they prove to me, I try to remove myself and my emotions from the case so I can move forward. Jarrett Fiorentino, this is very difficult. A young mom, just 23 years old, pregnant, I'm not sure how pregnant she is. I think I know, but I don't definitely know. Who is gunned down in her own home with her two-year-old. And guys, we're showing you a shot of the home. Notice, um, as we did when I was growing up, we didn't have a washer and dryer. You see the clothes hung out. They don't have a washer and dryer for other reasons. Because they live a, quote, humble life trying to walk in the footsteps of Christ's model. You see them there uh, walking because they're not driving cars. In this shot, I guarantee you the car you see going by is a tourist. That is their mode of transportation, using a horse and wheels, which the good Lord gave them. So the fact that this young mom has been shot multiple times in her home with her two and three-year-old child in the home, those are the facts we have so far, is unheard of. Jarrett Fiorentino, how do you remove yourself from the emotion 
of prosecuting a case, investigating a case where a young mom is slaughtered, a pregnant it, young mom. Nancy, it's damn near impossible to do that. You take those emotions and you let them motivate you in the investigation and the hard work you have to do, as you well know, in prosecuting these cases. You have a young 23-year-old mother. You have two children left without a mother and a little baby inside of her that will never have a chance at life. This is a tragedy all the way around and extremely difficult to prosecute, but that's the work of a prosecutor, as you well know. You have to put your emotions aside, consider the evidence and move forward. I know this, uh, it, it, it took us a long time to just get the name Rebecca Byler. And then we learned, we believe that she was six months pregnant, the baby viable. We know, or we think we know right now, that she was shot dead in the living room of her own home. Jared Fiorentino, we've heard nothing about a forced entry, uh, no sex attack, and no robbery. What do you make of that? Well, those things, as you know, are very telling. I've said before when I've been with you, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. You have certain things that didn't happen here. Two children that survived. You have no forced entry. It would suggest to investigators it's someone with familiarity uh, of the property and someone who felt the need not to harm those other two children. Those are certain things that will jump out at investigators. And I know we were talking about how rural this is. Nancy, there's rural and then there's Amish country. This is a throwback to a pre-technology time, which presents so many unique challenges to investigators and prosecutors in assessing what happened here. Hey, you know what? I'm glad you said that, Jared Fiorentino. Could you explain what you meant by that? A throwback to a time without technology. Sure. I mean, the, the Amish beliefs are an Anabaptist belief where technology is viewed by Amish people as almost like an interference in their community and uh, just a, a way to ostracize uh, themselves from one another and Christ, quite honestly. So any type of technology that usually assists investigators, like a cell phone, uh, would not be present in Amish country. It would be an outlier to have a cell phone in Amish country unless it was related to the work uh, one of the members of the community was engaged in. So as we said, you don't have cars passing by. You also don't have this unique tool of a cell phone typically in Amish country to assist in an investigation like this. You know, I'm just thinking about another aspect of this, and I want to go back to Jennifer Barrasso, who is actually joining us in the Pennsylvania jurisdiction. She's with KDKA TV. As you can see, she's outside, uh, out in the field, uh, joining us. Jennifer, thank you. I, I know it's cold, and I really appreciate you being with us. Jennifer, it's bad enough in my mind that a 23-year-old, it's basically a girl, she's 23, yet this girl is a grown woman with two children, a husband, a home, and about to give birth to her third child. Even if she didn't have the two children and the baby on the way, claiming somebody's life, murdering them at 23, I mean, I remember my fiance was about this age when he was murdered just before a wedding. And um, just the taking of a life before you can even really start your life. The, a, a, a young girl, I mean, the community has got to be devastated because I am, and I've never known Rebecca except in death. Tell me about how this has affected them and are they willing to come forward with information? Because I, I'm, I'm not sure anybody on the panel helped me out because I don't know. Um, aren't Amish, aren't they against judging anyone, making a judgment on another person? I mean, would they be willing to break ranks and come forward if they knew anything? And Nancy, I just looked this one up um, before we started the show and 
Yes, they typically don't report crimes before they happen, or well, obviously before they happen. But they typically don't report crimes proactively, at, you know, right in the moment. But they do cooperate with law enforcement once a crime has happened because they tend to try to insulate themselves from the outside. And so I'm hopeful that they will be cooperating much more than they would before this happens. In other words, if there is a domestic violence issue. Guys, this is Robin Drake speaking, behavior expert, former FBI special agent. That's the part I like. And listen to this. Chief of the FBI Counterintelligence Behavioral Analysis Program. Repeat. Chief of the FBI Counterintelligence Behavioral Analysis Program. I feel like I should just go home right now after saying that. Uh, author of Sizing People Up, a veteran FBI agent's manual for behavior prediction. Robin Drake uh, joining us. Robin, what further light can you shed on this? Because right now, police are begging for help. And I'm about to give you the one clue. Actually, let me give you the clue right now. Take a listen to our friend at CrimeOnline.com, Dave Mack. Sparta Township, Pennsylvania has a population of less than 2,000 people. This area, about 35 miles southeast of Erie, is Amish country. And in Amish country, horse and buggies are the preferred mode of transportation. So when a red Jeep is parked in the driveway at Andy and Rebecca Byler's home, family and friends take notice. It's around 10 a.m. on Monday. Some members of the community report seeing the red Jeep driving up and down their road earlier that morning. Okay, Robin Drake, I want to get back to you on the one clue that we've got so far a red Jeep driving up and down their road earlier that morning. Um, we think that she was killed um, before lunchtime and after the husband went to work. So that could be crucial. On the other hand, Robin Dreek, people tour. They go visit, as I did when I was living with my sister in Philly. They go tour Amish country. So what does the red Jeep really tell me? And does that mean riding up and down the road like we saw that car earlier, which is probably a tourist car, or up and down their driveway? Um, let's just start with the red Jeep, Robin. Yeah, well, it's an outlier, and that's what we're looking for in cases like this. This community is a community of massively established baseline normal behavior. So I agree with Jared wholeheartedly, you know, I spoke earlier that, we don't have a lot to go on, and but what we do have to go on is a profile. The likelihood of her knowing her murderer is really, really high when you're looking at stats. And when you have outliers of behavior like this red Jeep, you're immediately going to zero in on it. The challenge, as has been highlighted, is the, the distance between people. But at the same time, though, if you're looking at the fact that she most likely knew her murderer, if we're looking at stats, and it's a really, really small, tight community, even though they're spread out, the likelihood of other people in that community knowing or at least being able to provide leads is really high. And then when you can kind of triangulate a red Jeep on that, I'm, I'm the glass half full kind of guy in the sense of, hey, we just got to work the problem. And I think they hopefully will have enough just because this person, whoever it was, felt very, very safe in committing this crime in broad daylight in a home with two other children. Another issue, uh, Jennifer Barrasso, KDKA, is while we're getting conflicting reports, we're also getting a report that the red Jeep was actually in their driveway. What do you know? So police are not saying much uh, about that red Jeep, um, but they do tell me um, sources that um, they have people of interest, but no suspects. Um, they've checked out the husband. They're, they, they tell me that um, they are fairly confident his alibi checked out. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, Nancy, is that um, my source is telling me that they've had some burglaries um, of Amish residents in that area, not specifically saying on that dirt road, um, but that's one thing uh, they pointed out to me right now. Um, who was in that red Jeep? Um, they're not really elaborating much more than that. 
Guys, for those of you just joining us, uh, a beautiful young 23-year-old woman, practically a girl, six months pregnant with two children, two tots, ages two and three, we believe, in the home at the time mommy is murdered. You know, Dr. Jory's going to have to uh, figure out for me what effect this is going to have on them. But to Dr. Michelle Dupree joining me, renowned forensic pathologist, medical examiner, former detective with Lexington County Sheriff's Department, author of Money, Mischief, and Murder, The Murdoch Saga. In fact, she shot toward the forefront of the national conscious, consciousness when Alex Murdoch was prosecuted in her jurisdiction of South Carolina. But what interests me the most about Dr. Dupree is she is the author, literally wrote the book, Homicide Investigation Field Guide, which I have relied on many times, Dr. Dupree. Uh, Dr. Michelle, question to you. Do you remember when Alex Murdoch arranged his own shooting? I mean, he's just a pain in my rear end even now on a rural road by his drug dealing buddy and uh, relative and there were there was no surveillance cameras around and you and I were on air analyzing one day and we came up with the theory that the cameras at the far end of that rural road that intersected with a bigger highway should be checked. And in fact, there was an old Baptist church there with cameras that showed Murdoch and any other cars going onto that rural road. Now, while I know none of the Amish homes themselves have ring cameras, I really believe that step number one outside the processing of the crime scene in the home should be going to those locations where people would turn off to go to Amish country and review all the video, see if they can find the red Jeep turning in, because nobody in that neighborhood owns a red Jeep. I can promise you that. And catch it turning in from all points, all angles going to that location. It may be one, two, five, ten miles away, but they had to get there somehow. That's exactly right, Nancy, and that's an excellent idea. If we had cameras at either, either end of that road that might pick up a red Jeep and we could get the license plate number, that would be an excellent investigative tool, absolutely. Dr. Dupree, have you ever performed an autopsy on a pregnant lady? I have, Nancy. There was a, a motor vehicle accident, um, and we were actually able to, um, to extract the, the baby, and the baby did live, but the mother did not. You know, Dr. Dupree, uh, a, a, an ironclad rule of cross-examination or direct is to never ask the question, you don't know the answer. I just did that. I thought that's what you were going to say with all of your thousands of cases you've worked. Tell me about the death of Rebecca. She endured, we believe, multiple gunshot wounds in her own home, in her living room, and her unborn child died as well. Nancy, I, I can't fathom this. I am sure that she was scared to death, not just for her life, but for the life of her unborn child. I don't know where on the body she was shot, but I'm sure that it was terrifying and, and painful as well. And again, just thinking of her dying and her child dying must have been horrifying. How long would it have taken her to bleed out, either externally or internally? Of course, all that depends on how many times she was shot and where she was shot, but it could be as, as little as a few minutes to even longer, just again, depending on where she was shot. And regarding the baby, there, how long would the baby live after mommy was shot? Well, it would not be very long. She would have to have received almost immediate medical care um, and to have the baby probably removed by cesarean section, providing that none of the, the child or the um, placenta or anything was actually injured. So it would have been minutes, really. You know, I can remember uh, Dr. Dupree when I had an emergency delivery. I was to a point where I couldn't breathe very well at all. 
and they were just trying to get the twins out quickly, you know, to, to, to make sure that they survived. I'm just imagining all this family is going through now. The community is rallying around this family. Uh, the local residents are uh, raising money, food, anything to try to help the family. Guys, I want to go now to Dr. Jory Crawson, who I've mentioned several times to make sense of what we know. But first, Dr. Jory, I want you to hear more facts from Sydney Sumner from Crime Stories. It's just afternoon when Andy Byler and a friend arrive at the Byler home. He shares the home with his pregnant wife, Rebecca, and their two children. At around 12.15 p.m., Byler walks into his living room, finding his wife dead on the floor. After checking on his wife, Byler starts looking for his children, and the friend calls police. The children are in the home unharmed. The children in the home unharmed. To Dr. Yu, Dr. Jory Crawson, what effect will this have on them? Because so often we hear uh, misinformed individuals say, oh, they won't remember. They will remember one way or the other, Dr. Jory. Yeah, um, let me start off with, you know, you're born with just two fears, the fear of falling and loud noises. The gunshots are going to be re recorded in the memory, even of a two-year-old, okay? That fear factor is initiated with that loud sound, that explosion. Uh, so they're going to remember this, you know. It may start to be buried, of course, as they develop. The other factor you'd have to consider is the loss of their mother. They're in the stages now where they bond and attach, and that's where, you know, their self-confidence, their self-esteem, their identity, all of that is built on that attachment to the paternal figures, both mother and father. You know, uh, very often to you, Jarrett Fiorentino, we immediately look to the husband. But I'd like to hearken back to a case that I investigated and covered, the case of Pastor Davy Blackburn, who left one morning to go to the gym to work out really early in the morning. He came home to find his pregnant wife shot dead in the foyer, the entrance hall to their home, uh, his wife, Amanda. And everyone immediately assumed he was somehow involved. He wasn't. As a matter of fact, the perps were part of a burglary robbery crew that had been canvassing the neighborhood and came in the home when Amanda was there with her child and shot her dead for no reason. They could have just left, but they didn't. They killed her. So I think everyone should proceed with caution before the finger is pointed at the husband. Uh, weigh in, Jarrett. I agree, Nancy. All options have to be on the table. We cannot come at these kinds of cases with a prosecutorial bias. It will inhibit the investigation. It will cause investigators to look away from what could be relevant and important evidence. So as you said, there have been many cases where it has been the husband, but at the same time, there are those other cases where a third party was introduced or it was a burglary gone bad. All options right now appear to be on the table. And that red Jeep really throws uh, the possibility that there was someone from outside this community entering into that Amish community. And that's exactly how investigators have to look at it. A, a family left struggling to understand what has happened to a beloved wife, a young woman, just 23, and a mother to two. To Jennifer Barrasso joining us, I understand that the time of death has been now estimated to be between 8.30 a.m. and 12.15. I'm assuming they're getting the 12.15 because that's the time the husband came home with the friend. I don't know if 8.30 is the time he left or if they're somehow determining that time from the state of her body. So we were trying to um, ask police more about that. Um, they are staying tight-lipped. Um, just what um, I was told that like other Amish families, um, this this mother would um, get up and um, she would uh, do the laundry. Um, 
make breakfast. Um, the house was um, very clean. Um, and what, what the, when the husband actually left for work um, and what he did that morning, um, what brought him home around 12, uh, police just aren't saying. Um, I know that uh, they have interviewed um, the husband and basically sources telling me that um, his alibi at this checks out. Um, they, they have people of interest, uh, but no suspects in this uh, case right now. Um, but really trying to get those details uh, about what made him come home. Um, we're still waiting to hear from police on that. Oh, okay. So that's making me wonder, did he not normally come home uh, for lunch? So when you say they're trying to figure out what made him come home, now I want to know why he came home. Robin Drake joining me, behavioral expert, formerly chief of FBI counterintelligence behavioral analysis program, now author. Robin, again, thank you for being with us. Um, very often you'll hear uh, a lot of pushback. Wow, you're looking at the husband. Yeah. I always look at the husband, the boyfriend, the lover, the ex, because statistically, they did it. Bam. There you go. Those are the statistics. I didn't make them up. They are gathered from thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of examples. That's why statistically you look at the husband. That does not mean the husband did it. And in fact, in this case, he seems to have an alibi. Yeah, and that's why they call it profiling, because you create an ideal resume of someone that would typically commit this type of crime based on research and data that you can then take and create an overlay so that when you have all these leads coming in, hopefully there's lots of leads coming in, you can start creating a filter based on that ideal resume or profile. And again, this community is, is a community of pattern. They've done the same thing for a hundred, couple hundred years. And so hopefully the people are going to notice a deviation from that pattern, both with individuals, vehicles, obviously, um, whether, whether I, I really hope that there is cameras at the ends of, of the road, you know, when they enter the main highway, maybe the individual, if they were from outside, again, you got to go where the leads and the evidence takes you without that pre presumption. Well, here's another thing. We know that Amish are pacifists. That's mm -hmm. very well documented. We know that from every single war that the U.S. has uh, been involved in. But weapons are not forbidden. Guns are not forbidden amongst the Amish. Are you surprised? I was. Um, I really wouldn't consider but when you kind of do that overlay of self-reliance and resilience in a, in a more rural kind of life hunting would be you know, appropriate and so you would have a firearm for hunting but violence against others that is abhorrent to them that is against all things and so it, it, it's just boy this is a real curious one just because there's a lot of there's a lot of small data points that are kind of standing out from that firearms is a huge one that's standing out because of the type of community but the red truck is also standing out again i'm really i can't i'm really looking forward to see what law enforcement says next when they finally do let some information out there because i think it's going to have a lot of details in it that will hopefully be helpful well the amish are so dedicated to pacifism they don't even celebrate holidays that laud honor or glorify the military or any military victory they don't even do that but guns apparently did not fit into their definition of technology. I'm not sure exactly why, but I do know now, because of this case, that guns are allowed in Amish communities. At first, I thought, wait a minute, a gun, that means nobody in their neighborhood or community did it. That's not entirely true. However, just as you said, Robin Drake, the red Jeep is the fly in that ointment because the perp may have not only had, well, we know the perp had a gun, and yes, it is a he, count on it, but they yep. may have been driving a red Jeep. What more do we know? Take a listen to what we know about the autopsy. This is Sydney Sumner, Crime Online. Investigators aren't releasing information from Byler's autopsy, but they do say the findings help determine when Rebecca Byler was killed, and that has investigators asking for the community's help. They're looking for information on Byler's movements from 8.30 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. on Monday, as that was when Byler and the two children were at the home alone. 
and more from Rachel Bonilla, Crime Stories. Police cars lined Fish Flats Road outside the Byler home. Rebecca Byler's death has been ruled a homicide. Authorities have not yet revealed how Byler was killed, but according to CBS News, Byler was shot multiple times. Police say the crime does not look like a robbery as there's no evidence that anything was taken from the home. For now, there are no suspects or a motive. The fact that nothing was taken from the home, Jarrett Ferentino, I find probative. It proves something to me that robbery was not the motive. However, in the case of Pastor Davy Blackburn, his wife Amanda was killed. As I recall, nothing was taken from that home either. The perps had intended to burglarize it, but I don't recall if anything was actually taken. So the fact that we can't find anything taken does not mean the motivation was not robbery. I, I agree, Nancy. This is something where Rebecca could have happened upon someone that entered the home the killing occurred and that person fled the scene, although it was ultimately their intention to commit the robbery when they entered the property. So that is an option that has to certainly be considered. Well, yeah, I think you're right. Dr. Jory Crosen, you're the shrink. Um, think about it. She was shot dead from what we know, fully clothed, in the living room, which means to me, did she hear somebody coming in the front door when they weren't supposed to be. Like, I know what time my children are gonna walk through the door, what time my husband's gonna walk through the door, what time my mom is gonna come out of her room. I know that, and when I hear it, I know what it is. Did she hear the front door open and went, whoa, what, who's that? And went to go explore because she was gunned down right there in the living room. Looking at the suspect, whoever it may be, you know, with the behavior pattern, he may have come in to like rob or burglarize, got startled, uh, shot her, saw the two children, and then just abandoned that plan. Like, I got to get out of here now. So now the survival mode kicks in and he just, he takes nothing. He, he wants to get away. He wants to get out of there. That's the scenario. I'm just trying to figure know. out what police, as if they need our help, but what should police be doing right now? What about it, Robin Drake? I'm looking at all everyone from past relationships. You know, I used to watch a show, Breaking Amish. And when you look at the average age of the population of this small Amish community, it's in the 40s, which means that the younger people are leaving in droves, not droves necessarily, but it's, it's, it's a decreasing population when I looked at this particular area, which means that there could have been someone in this woman's background that has left the community and maybe come back again it's a hypothesis and we're going to go where the data and the leads follow us and the evidence follows but when i see a red jeep when i see i mean it can be anything like you said a burglary gone bad but man it's in the middle of nowhere they kind of knew when to go to the house when the husband's going to be away and nothing was taken i mean like you said when you look at all the statistics and you create that overlay in that profile it's kind of leading you down the path that most not most likely the high probability that she knew who murdered her so we're, i'm looking at and interviewing everyone that in that community that knows each other really really well and who from the past should we have a conversation with especially if they might not be part of the community anymore we are learning at this moment a suspect has emerged jackie howard what do you know Nancy, we just learned from the search warrant filings for the Byler home that Rebecca Byler appeared to have suffered cutting wounds to her neck and head. Now, this is obviously physically different from the reports of the gunshots that we had before, but the neck and head are areas of the body that bleed the most. So it's easy to see why that was the initial conclusion from witnesses at the scene. Trooper Adam Black, who filed the search warrants, wrote the victim's husband, Andy Byler, found the body a short distance inside the home. A woman previously described by police as a family friend called 911. Police say so far the investigation and autopsy have given investigators an idea of what the murder weapon may have been, but it is not in police custody. The warrants are for knives, blades, cutting instruments, and other items. 
Again, police have not said how Rebecca Byler was killed. So far, there are no suspects, and police are asking for the public to report any tips or suspicious people, vehicles, or activity in the area of Fish Flats Road. Pennsylvania Crime Stoppers say there's a $2,000 reward for information. If you know or think you know anything about the brutal murder of Rebecca Byler and her unborn child, please call 814-663-2043. Repeat, 814-663-2043. There is a GoFundMe online right now where funds are being gathered to help the family of Rebecca Byler. We wait as justice unfolds. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.